inside Martin Odegaard. Zinchenko from Ketia. It's in. It's Perfect. There is a gorgeous arrogance about Arsenal now. It really is. They are enjoying every second of this. Hello and welcome to Not Another Arsenal Podcast, aka the Lucas Podolski of Arsenal Podcast. My name is Mike Hurz, your host. And today, boys and girls, we made it after 14 years. We're one of the last eight teams in the Champions League. That's right, baby. We made the quarterfinals with a little bit more struggle than anticipated. But hey, man, a win is a win. First and foremost, as always, the introductions. Let's get this ball rolling. Chris, welcome back. Chris, I'm going to deactivate your Twitter account myself if I continue to to see you to fight poor souls out there. How are you doing, man? You know what's funny is that every time I, I would see some sort of inane opinion... I would realize that Kelly beat me to it almost inevitably every single time. <laughs> Kelly's like so smug. I love it. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know. Maybe he's taken the chief banter title away from me this last week. Um, but I, I fought the good fight this week. Um, I fought probably no fewer than eight fan bases on my own. Um, well, with <laughs> nice. Kelly's, maybe I'm his sidekick. Maybe he's my, he's my sidekick. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Maybe we're just each other's wingmen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but lo- lots, lots of Chelsea, Spurs, United, Liverpool fans in the mud this week. It, it's it's been really fun, mm-hmm. and I find it so interesting that these teams who are either not in Europe or not in the Champions League are the loudest to talk, and they want to come at us and discredit everything we're doing. And I mean, fair fucks to them. Like we haven't won the Champions League before ever and we haven't been in this position for 14 years so of course they're going to gloat and they're going to talk and they're going to try and um rustle some feathers until we win it but damn it we are on the precipice of something great this season or maybe next season and i just want us to see it over the finish line because it's going to be glorious we're all going to be insufferable even sebi will be insufferable and this man is like the nicest man in the world but he will he will turn insufferable if we win the champions league so um i just can't wait so sebi doesn't like that you're committing him to that obligation (laughs) (laughs) Sebi's going to deactivate from twitter if we win the champions league he's going to be be in jail let's not go making promises for other people yet or chris we don't know how we're going to behave of course, Kelly is back, back to back weeks for you, Kelly. Always a pleasure to have you on. How are you doing, Brad? I'm doing well too, and and yeah, it's um, it's been a great couple of days for my priors. For anybody who's a regular listener here, which is which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been I've been going back. There's been other guys. I feel like I'm piggybacking on some of the hard work. People drudging up some stuff from like December, and and oh. and, and pulling up some stuff from a long time ago. I mean. The, the internet is forever, and, and I'm confident that I have some terrible takes on there, but it's been a lot more fun to see other people's shit takes be pulled up and then us being able to just absolutely jump on top of it and just just fucking cinch that neck. It's been it's been quite good, but including yeah, inter fans, which has been really fun today. Yeah, we, we actually had an inter fan who was talking yeah, out of all the lot people of shit you could beef with. <laughs> in, in December, and we were able to go back to that post, and he's like, "Yeah, man, I'll take the L." <laughs> like it was actually, it was actually a, a quite magnanimous intervention. Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I, oh, I, I remember this guy, right, and I was you, like, "I'm gonna you go have your receipt. receipt." So I had a yeah, genuine question for you, Chris, because you know how it, it, the the guy that said that he would only have Saka and Udegaard in, in the squad, and everybody else was better than an Arsenal player. Yeah, that guy in the yeah, injured squad. You know, the, that guy that replied to a big account, he didn't have a lot of followers. So not a lot of people saw that tweet. But I got to ask you, you know how there's little stats underneath the tweets? Yep. So it had like X number of, of, you know, seen X number of retweet. And it literally said bookmarks. One. Yeah. Chris, was were you the one with the one bookmark? <laughs> Did you bookmark that tweet and said, son of a bitch, if what? Inter ever go out of the Champions League, I'm going to backtrack. What 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 do you think, Mike? <laughs> I, I, believe 100%. I believe you have more bookmarks than any of us three combined. I spent like 20 minutes going through old bookmarks and deleting or unbookmarking things that weren't relevant anymore and then bookmarking a whole host of other things. So it's been a it's been a fun day. 
<laughs> like you had to unbookmark all the Atletico Madrid fans. That's yeah, like, the in, in well, these are yes. right now. <laughs> all right, fair, fair, fair. And last but not least, Sebi, welcome back, dude. We missed you last week. How's everything? Very good. Are we going to talk about the game, or are we just going to what hate watch the hate watchers from yesterday for <laughs> the next hour and a half? Two a hours. little from column A, a little from column B. Uh, okay, because I prefer to do that. Yeah, that that'd be a really really fun. I, it's so crazy how much time these other fan bases just spent uh, hoping that we lost. <laughs> well, well, they're not watching the Champions League anymore, so it's just it does, it does free up some time. If, when Spurs were in the Champions League, I was not watching them. I, I was doing <laughs> anything else but watching them. It's so strange. Yeah. Anyway. You were enjoying life, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's What's amazing if you were to text me and be like, "Hey guys, let's do a fucking live stream watch along for Manchester United." Doing something, like, <laughs> what? Who yeah. fucking cares? Like, what are you talking about? You and then crazy. unfriend us and and lose our phone numbers. Oh my god! In, in like the the one in question, there was like six Chelsea fans hate watching live streaming and commenting and rooting against Arsenal against Porto. It's like. You know that's gonna be. A, you watch the first match, right? It's a fucking terrible match. Like, off. it's not even enjoyable for us. It's not even fun. I wouldn't like, want to rewatch that if I had. Oh, the I, I won't. I won't. It's, mm -hmm. it's some of the, the worst football ever. And the only good thing is that we won, mm -hmm. and that's it. And we have a new person to hate in Sergio Conceição, who I'm sure will take plenty of boots to the ribs and well deserved. But Indeed. he'll probably find me and tell me that I fucked his mom or something. No. <laughs> he made it a seems perfect, like I'd be on the internet. Uh, he made a perfect uh, enemy out of himself with some of the comments that he made, not only after the first game, before the second game, and after the second game. So he did a really good job at being a supervillain. Good thing he doesn't speak English well, or else he might be hearing from his lawyers. Right, yeah. you know, this time As an now. aside, every single Lazio account, because Mauricio Sarri just resigned unexpectedly this week, um, every every Lazio account and fan wants uh, Sergio Conceição to be the manager of Lazio. To well, be the, I'll That's actually them. a great fit because everybody hates Lazio too. So <laughs> synergy. Are they the Porto of Italy? Yes, Kelly. Yes, yeah. they are. Except Porto yeah. actually wins stuff, and Lazio does not. So <laughs> oh, burn on your own team. No, it is what it is, baby. You know what? We we have the notes all prepared and stuff, and I just barely noticed right now. I'm like, we don't even have notes of the actual game. So let, look, let's talk about a few key points. Um, one top of my head, Chris. If you want to tackle this, uh, injury time. Um, surprise me <laughs> yeah that yeah. first half i was genuinely confused about that first half injury time out of all the shit that porto did it was clear since minute one that they were wasting time that the crowd let the ref know that the goalie was doing it it was clear as day the porto players were flopping falling over taking forever to do throw-ins everything that we saw in the first half uh, in the first game excuse me and then he proceeds to give one minute. And as soon as the 90th minute hits, a Porto player falls down. And then the by 40, the time... In the 45th minute? 45th minute, yeah. yes. Thank you. By the time he gets back up, it's he just pretty much just blows for the first half. He did that in the second <laughs> half practically, did two extra <laughs> times. I'm not entirely sure. Chris, enlighten me a little bit. Are we, or should we expect... Just a different type of behavior, I guess, between Europa League, sorry, Champions League refs and Whoa, over the APL. I know flashback there. Uh, there's a lot of things in this game I didn't really understand. I mean, it, in the two ties, honestly, the 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 injury time was one of them. You know, it, it's odd because in the Premier League, we it's not uncommon to get ten minutes of extra time in a in a half, and and we saw. The ball, I think Orbino quoted um, the stat that the ball was in exactly half the time out of the 120 some odd minutes that the game was played. Minutes. Yeah. And um, if that's the case, then clearly there needs to be more than one minute of stoppage time at, at the end of the first half and whatever it was, three minutes at the end of the, of the second half. Um, what's What's hilarious is that I think he gave was it the first half of the second half, whatever time they gave, he blew, like there was time wasting within the stoppage time. And then he did, he blew the whistle before like the, like, like the Whoa. quoted stoppage time yeah. um, occurred. I think it was the first half. So they quoted one minute of stoppage time. Correct. There was like 40 of that, 40 seconds of that minute was wasted because people were on the ground feigning injury. 
And then he blew the whistle at like 55 seconds. And I felt like I was back at AFCON, you know, or <laughs> World Cup, wherever that was, where like, was Af- 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 yeah, Maybe, where the uh, like, go to the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. Where AFCON, yeah, in a hotly contested match, he just blew like three minutes into a seven <laughs> minute stoppage time for some reason, really? for some reason, like just no. to, to, to make himself the biggest part of the show humanly possible. That was just remarkable stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd be fine with that if we were up 2-0 and we were talking about like the 91st minute instead of the 45th minute. But, but there he, was would have, he would have played eight more minutes of stoppage time if that was the case. Though. Well, of course he would. So that's that's one example. The other thing, and I was doing some research today. I couldn't find anything about it. But you know how in the Premier League, whenever there's a VAR review, we get replay after replay. We get the lines drawn. We get close-ups from five different angles on a on a on a foul in the box um you get none of that in the champions league and so in some ways i kind of like it because it it harkens back to the days before var where like whatever was called in the pitch kind of stood and you didn't have to obsess over a replay where something is zoomed in one thousand times and the 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 frame rate is slowed down so slow that like anything looks like a foul um, but at the same time, like, for example, in the second half, and maybe we'll talk about this separately, but the Odegaard, um, goal that was called back because of, uh, a tiny shirt pull by Havertz, we, I think we may have seen one replay. Um, but, but we didn't get any like commentary from the commentators of what VAR was saying about that, about that particular incident. And I think we've all been conditioned to expect that watching the Premier League over and over again. So it was just a... That was a really odd, I think, part of it, too. And then, I don't know, I, I felt like there was, like, a lot of calls that the that the referee was calling that were ticky-tack on, on certain individuals. But then, like, Saka would get booted into Rosette by a player, and, like, he would be, like, play on. So, I don't know. There was something very odd going on in that game. And I don't know if it's, like, Continental referees, like, their standards are different. I, I don't know what that specific VAR situation is, if that's just like a rule that UEFA... Maybe um, the only thing I could think of for the VAR situation, maybe they didn't have a translator because it was a French referee. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe... L- look, uh, uh, maybe... Uh, they didn't but they've anybody, got to all speak uh, English, do they not? Huh? They all have to speak English, though, do they I not? was going to say... They can't but maybe they were that. communicating in French uh, th- through VAR. Oh, and, the, uh, and the announcers... Or, or the commentators didn't know what they were saying. That's, That's the point. only reason why I would yeah. say that they didn't say what what actually happened. That's the, the only thing I can think of. More realistically, they probably are on some sort of remit to to move very very quickly through things, and that they don't, in the interest of keeping the game moving, they don't need to provide any explanation well, or detailed lines. That- and that's a big complaint in the in the Premier League that VAR takes ten minutes to yeah. to draw a line or whatever. So that's the only thing I could think of for that. I'm so, going to say that I'm okay with, with how it played out. Just uh, and, and I'm speaking exact, uh, specifically about the, the announcers talking about VAR. Um, mm-hmm. I just, it's become so tedious. Like we, we were conditioned yep. to see it in the EPL, like, like Chris said, mm-hmm. and it's like, it just, it's a major talking board point for like five, 10 minutes when it does happen. And it just yeah. becomes just a little too overwhelming for me. So seeing the champions and getting handled like that, it's a little bit like the thorough, like the old days, if you will. Where you're like, ah, uh, you accept the call. There was let's like it's almost like there was no review. You accept the call. It was it was foul. Goal didn't go in, and you're just and you then you piss right. And it just that little play lives on in history of the game. And of course, I've cited this my one of my most villainous and popular opinions, uh, as as you guys know, is the the hand of God, right? Yeah, Maradona. I I like I think Maradona's legacy grew you know, 10 times bigger that day, right? To, to do something that cheek in such an important game and there was no review. And as crazy as this sounds, because I, I totally understand being on the like wrong side of that. Um, we, we've had our history with Barcelona. I almost just think that like those moments live for better, or for worse, forever in history of football. Like no Arsenal fan won't look back at that Barcelona game and not remember that shit still where it's been probably like 10 plus years at this point, we'll remember it for another 10 years. Yeah, We remember when United beat Arsenal, for, you know, to end their streak, et cetera, et cetera. So like that. So for me, I don't know, in a really weird way, I, I kind of like it. 
<laughs> I like the. I see your masochist. Almost, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it gave me football without VAR in a way, well, and I enjoyed it. You bring up a good point, though, Mike, because maybe it's a very purposeful move by UEFA that they've seen in domestic leagues that and they're looking at England specifically that the conversation has moved beyond a conversation about football and it's become a conversation about controversies. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe I'm giving UEFA too much credit here, but perhaps UEFA is interested in the game being talked about and not the soap opera that's happening sort of uh, in the background, in the foreground, really in England, but hopefully in the background in, in, in European competition. So I think it actually worked because honestly, if you wouldn't have asked me about the time, about the time, I wouldn't have brought this up. I think in general, well, I wasn't necessarily, I was, I was dumbfounded by some of the refereeing decisions um, because I never got to see a real VAR replay, or at least it wasn't, it wasn't shown to me 5 million times in the span of two seconds. Um, I tended to accept that whatever, whatever was called in the pitch, I guess is what it's going to be. And I don't have, I, I'm not, I'm not left with second guessing. I'm not left with a controversial opinion. I'm not, not left with like conspiracy theories where, oh, is this guy just, you know, you know, getting, getting the, uh, you know, under the table payment from Porto, like the, like the referee was in 2006 when we lost to Barcelona mm -hmm. on the RVP second yellow card. So, yes, sir. um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a lovely, again, if it's, whether it's, um, on purpose or whether it's accidental, it's a lovely kind of time machine moment of going back to the days, you know, pre whatever it was, 2019, when VAR didn't exist, where we could all kind of live in a bubble where the football was the point and not the not the referee. Very nice, Seb. I saw you almost nodding in tremendous disagreement with something Chris said. Am I, am I reading too much into your... No, I just, as soon as he talked about that referee from the Barcelona game, I just saw oh. his face <laughs> in my mind. It and was? It just, oh, that freaking face. <laughs> like, piece of garbage, man. I, I'll never forget that day. Just the... Inf I was so infuriated. <laughs> I just wanted to kill... Kill. Any Barcelona mm. fan I saw, good thing I was at home watching it. But uh, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> no, till this day, one. you see the you see the replays, and you're like, ah, motherfucker. What could it's it's been? like the one time in the history of football that, that happened. It happened for Barcelona during a time where they were actively paying officials. Yeah, in the and Champions like, League. And home. we we all knew, all four of us knew what was going oh. on that day. Oh yeah, and it, was it total. took what? How many years for it to? finally come out that and that's kind of been buried too because bars yeah. is such a big brand too like yeah. they kind of went away that they were like making making these clandestine payments to the subsidiaries and like secondary yeah. business accounts of all these officials then in la liga <laughs> and i mean they really should be in like the fourth tier but la liga needs them too much and, and oh yeah they the there's too many barcelona fans to go and give them the death penalty that they deserve which sucks. It's, it's, I remember so the serious. actual guy from Spain. He's on recording, like giving strongly suggesting not punishing Busquets for something because he was going to miss a Clasico, yeah. and it was like yeah. it's just it's going to be a big miss, ratings and everything. And he's just like insisting to not get Busquets suspended. And surprise, surprise, the media's like, "Oh my god, he avoided suspension somehow." And you're like, "You motherfucker." <laughs> so this, but it's good. It's good for my priors. We're gonna get into yeah. to Kelly's priors a little bit later. But my priors are is my priors is that shit exists everywhere and nobody's above it. And I'm a big believer in it. So mm. uh, point on point for me when it comes to that, I guess. Uh, oh yeah, we tiptoe a lot around the the actual penalty call, and I, I guess let's fast forward it a little bit, Kelly. And let's just talk about it since we we were kind of alluding to it when we were talking about the differences between your Euro, mm -hmm. european refs and epl refs um penalty for you yay or nay um which which incident are we talking about here um we're fast forwarding to the second half where i b believe it happened in the second half yeah when yeah. uh guard's goal no yeah second half so so penalty or the foul that pulled back the goal uh the Dude, I completely forgot about the penalty. Well, okay, we had a there was a penalty. Challenge. Yeah, there was, it was the Trossard one. Um, R R Chris mentioned that Udegaard Cole that got disallowed. Yeah, uh, oh, let's, yeah. Run let's run with that. We're going to start off with that incident from the second half, and then we'll back oh, yeah. back to the first. 
Yeah. So, so I think it's one of those, it, it's, it, it's, we talk, we've kind of viewed a cultural clash, right. Of how leagues are officiated with two different referees and referees within the premier league and kind of the soft touch, like in the premier league, that is never, ever going to get called back. It's not going to be called back on the pitch. And I think that's even one too, that if that was not, there's a good chance in the premier league that that would be overruled and given as a goal. It was really, really, really soft. It was a desperation dive basically by Pepe when he saw what was happening it was a very, very light contact, very light kind of grasp at his back by Havertz. And it was just a fuck up between the the keeper and the center back, and it should have stood. But here's what ended up happening. And, and I think it's it's maybe it was more frustrating because the, the official took a really long time to yeah. call it a penalty. Or, or that Mike Amdon, the same thing you did, call, yeah. call it a foul. It was a good probably two seconds afterwards to the point where like Odegaard had knee slid already, and then he pulled it back. So it's like, it's one of those that in by the standards of the of of the VAR and by the standards of what we've seen in the in the Champions League, I, I guess I get it. I don't I don't enjoy a game where it's that soft and it became even more infuriating again as Chris mentioned earlier that this official vacillated wildly between calling touch fouls and having people get absolutely fucking clobbered and not being a foul at all. Yeah. So he really was poor and inconsistent in that, and I I think. Mikey, you and I have talked about this specifically. Like, you got to want to pull that back to do that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You 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 have to be re very very receptive to the idea that okay, we're gonna keep it close, or like if it's any marginal stuff, like we're gonna not not gonna let any funny business get in the way. This has to be it. Arsenal have to score with a pure goal here. It can't be slop. Like. It's. I think it's really. It's. It's one of those seventy thirty that it's not a not a foul. And I think usually, at least in the Premier League, what we're used to seeing is that usually, um, or lately, I guess, um, on the pitch anyway, um, our, our watches are kind of tuned to the idea that unless it's super egregious, the official on the on the field is going to allow it to play and then let VAR sort it out later. And that's just not what's happening in the Premier League or in the Champions League at all. It's the referee makes a decision and that the decision seems binding. There's a very quick um var check that we're not privy to like we said and that's it so when he called it it was almost no chance because i mean i guess in the interpretation of the law it's it i guess it could be a foul but it's pretty marginal contact and it's a pretty big gift for porto that's and and i think it's exacerbated too by how soft the whistle was in the first match and like we, I mean, we have the benefit of hindsight now so it's not something we talk about a lot because we won dramatically and it was more fun to win it that way and more it tortured Porto more. So like, we're all happy that we won the way that we won and we're going to the international because everybody has three weeks off. So like, it doesn't hurt us yeah. at all. But at the time it is one of those. It's like, God, fuck, will you let, will you let the fucking players win the match. Don't do that shit. Don't yeah. make the really, really soft penalty call. Don't make the really, really soft goal overturn. Like don't make yourself the story. Don't, don't make yourself the story. And I think that it's, it's <clears throat> been, we ran into two officials who really played. They were really all over the place. I think the first match, it was incre like an incredibly soft Porto whistle. And then this match, again, it wasn't even that it was like a soft whistle. It was that he was like so soft and then so like so hands off, like within the same match. Yeah, it, it didn't was... make any sense. You know, the, the two referees were so different from each other. The first mm. referee was let himself be intimidated by the crowd at Porto. Mm -hmm. And Blueberry. This referee, yeah, try like was not going to be intimidated by the crowd at the mm. Emirates. Isn't and that funny? Basic and yeah. basically, every time the crowd got on him about something, he refused to acknowledge it and said, "No, I'm going to call it this way." So he was being really French, I guess. He was. It's one of no one. <laughs> yeah. And and speaking about the consistency, and you know that you mentioned, it's like on the yellow cards things. I, like I was even kind of like surprised to see a few yellow cards because there was so much, so many similar player pressures, ball possession from back, ball possession falls over, foul. Mm -hmm. I felt like I've seen that that like I, I saw that foul play out 10 to 15 times, I think. And there was like two incidents that were there were a card. And I was a little left confused because of the consistency, as you guys said. So on one end, 
look, he, he was calling every contact and maybe Kai, you know, he touched them. The other, the other player made his, his, um, exaggeration of the contract and of the contact. And, you know, he bought himself a foul. The, the delay, Kelly, I, I do think it's almost like the goal went in. Mm-hmm. It was a goal. And there was like a 30, 30, 40 second delay. And that maybe that's when VAR is like, now we check that wave it. It's very similar to, to an offside that they, that played out. Mm-hmm. Like I felt like there was an offside that happened in this in the first half, if I'm not mistaken, where the guy, ch- you know, Saka chased the ball. The defender, the defender defended it. It went back to the goalie, and like literally, what felt like 20 seconds later, yeah, like oh, it's offside. And I'm like, like wait, what? And it and it just on TV again. If if VAR didn't exist, we could almost be like. It was a delayed whistle, but because VAR exists in the TV wasn't highlighting VAR, it made it seem like for a TV viewer, you're like, you're almost confused. Like, why are you stopping this this game now, 20 seconds later? And like, oh, they, they're finally done reviewing VAR. And it turned out it was an offside, which yeah. is it, nutters. There, there, was an, there was another really weird one, too, where I think Porto, like late in the second half, were very offsides. And they let it run for fucking ages. Yeah. And like yeah. everybody had to like collapse back for Arsenal and like Declan Rice, I think it was like cramping up, sprinting back. And it's like one of those like I, I hate that. This is this is not the time when he's offsides by two full yards. Like <laughs> yeah. you don't let it run for another 20 seconds. Will you just fucking put the flag up? Like yeah. this is the last time they're gonna try to do anything here. Like to just be, give us the ball back. Come on. To to be honest with you, when I saw that we were gonna have him as the referee, I was I was very happy about it because he is he's at least the, a known quantity. He is like the the best known as the best referee in France. Like yeah. he's mm-hmm. like the face of the referees in in Ligue 1. So for him like to to referee that game was just it was just so hot and cold. Everything that he was doing was so it's like there's like there's like a one off. Nothing led up to it. Everything was like refereed in, in yeah. an individual instance. No. Yeah, you saw whatever. tackles that were like like Saka gets cleaned out. Nothing's called, and then you Pepe like falls over because Havertz blew on like touched his shoulder, and Boom. and he calls a foul. It's it was just very odd. I I, yeah. I was very. And, and I disappointed in his in his performance. And, and Arsenal, he's, he's a disgrace to his federation. Uh, um, and, I, I, you know what? I thought too, the like World Cup in '98. I would think he liked us. I, I, well, well, the biggest. I think the thing with that too is that, like, I don't think. I, I think the first leg was overtly again. He was like Mikey, like you said, was captured by the crowd. Sebi was completely influenced by it and became. He he was really pulling hard or creating a game state that vastly favored one side. Yeah. I don't think he was doing that. I just think he was bad. It was just a bad yeah. refereeing performance. Like, he was intimidated he, by the crowd. Yeah, the, in the first leg, but the, even this guy, I don't think he was inti- – I think he was just all over the place. He was just super inconsistent. That becomes frustrating. And, like – because even, like, with Havertz, too, like, somehow Havertz and Kanse saw who were both on a yellow. Thank God they both didn't get red carded. But, like, that's – one of those things where he handled that beautifully, right? He gave both guys a talking to, he talked to Havertz. Like you're not going to throw Havertz out for Conce. So being out of the technical area and fucking being in the wrong spot and him like shoving him off of him, just the same way. You're not going to send Conce Sal off 65 minutes into a second leg tie where it's a draw right now because he was chopping it up with an Arsenal player. He handled that, that beautifully talk to everybody, say, calm the fuck down. Don't be doing that. But then again, he would just be all over the place. And I think I'm sure it's a struggle to be consistent, but like it, it's it, it rarely vacillates between like a one or two on the contact scale and then like seven or eight. It's usually a pretty large, larger, like <laughs> kind of like more of a gradient between the calls. It's rarely just like and just fucking all over the place. And I just think he. I, I just think he just, he just had a bad game and he made some, he, he made, it's, he, he let too many things go that pulled his, that pulled his whistle and what he was going to call too far. Whoa, whoa, the physical. whoa. Family show, family show. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he, after what and, we call it today, Atletico Madrid, Inter Milan, um, oh, that's not God. even considered a family friendly football game. Oh, if you God. watch the game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Go on, Kelly. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. No, um, it, it's it's definitely one of those where it's just a weird one, and it was hard to get our it, hard to get our like hands on it. And I think for players too, it was probably awfully confusing as well. And I think both both teams too were just kind of like 
I, I don't even think everybody was like incensed. It was just everybody looked kind of confused the entire match because of how much how all over the place it was. And it's maybe just uh, Saka had a bad game, and, and the ref had a bad game too. Because again, he's not known for being a sh- like a shit ref or anything. No, he's known as the not. best the best French domestic ref there is, and he's in basically every major club and international tournament. He's an official, so. I guess we, we got through a shitty officiating performance, but yeah. it is what it is. All right, man. We, we, I, I got to tell you, I wasn't expecting to have this huge conversation about the referee, but here we are in, in typical on, on brand Mikey on brand. On, Mike, on brand. It's, like that, it's that, it's that gift. First time. Yes. The guy with the noose around his neck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's a quality, so, quality meme. Quality um, meme. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so for more setup for everybody that's in there, it's the meme where he's got a noose around. It's like he's looking at the other guy that's on the that's getting set up to be executed all on mass. They're just gonna drop the floor and lynch everybody. And so he looks over and goes, first time. <laughs> With a big old cheesy smile. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Like, Dude, there's nothing to fear. Don't worry, you're good. Mm-hmm. Seb, let's and, talk about the Trossard incident in the first half. Um, I don't, I don't, which one? The what are you talking about? The, you talk about the goal or the the PK? I, I don't we're, remember. We're going to cover the ugly part first. We're going to go with the PK. Um, I don't remember that one. So let's go to Chris for that one. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, I'll come back to you, Chris. Talk to me about the penalty shot. I don't remember this one either. What are you talking about, Mike? <laughs> are you high, dude? <laughs> I. I want to be high right now, but I'm not. But Mike really wants to talk about all the controversy. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Are we moving I, I on. Are, did am I imagining somebody grabbing Trossard from the collar? Yeah, that, that was in the. That was the. <laughs> Ask Kelly. I have no idea. That's that was from Brentford. The, the Brentford game, buddy. <laughs> you guys are <laughs> shitty right now. <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna go back and rewatch this game, and I'm gonna I'm gonna record this. You guys, <laughs> are... red oh red. my god, I love wow. that. Put that up and put that. Okay, up Ra- yeah, now that we are talking about Trosser, though, um, <laughs> okay, again go on. with Roz, right? How how weirdly does he look like the ref? <laughs> how do we not put that <laughs> together before all the roads match? Go back to the ref. Oh my god, they're walking off talking to each other at the end of the first half. It's like, oh god, they really it's his really older look brother. similar. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. this is like like they even have the kind of like. Like the sleepy headed second shift eyes and everything too, yeah. and like the same haircut. It's like this is yeah. fucking same weird, haircut man. and everything. It's the Spider Man meme. Yeah, because people are doing face That's swaps like on them. Yep. Like it, it just didn't just put like an Arsenal jersey on the ref and a ref jersey on Trossard. <laughs> you still had to do like a double take. It's like why do they look so weirdly similar? It doesn't make any sense. And again, oh, I man. I knew that that who that ref was from watching all the major tournaments and everything. Totally. And obviously, I know Trossers, and I just it, in my brain it never connected that they are like separated at birth, twinsy people. Yeah, <laughs> and and like for Trosser on the way off, do you think that comes up? It's like, like you make a joke about it. It's like you're you're looking at your double that's like three inches taller than you, and that's it. Funny. <laughs> Mike's just higher than a giraffe's ass here. <laughs> just. <laughs> The Mike 10, the ten new listeners yeah. that we got because of because uh, so uh, Sophie yeah. shouted us out are like oh, these guys are so lame like this guy doesn't <laughs> know what the hell he's talking no. about I'm he doesn't still, even know what game he's talking about in my <laughs> mind I'm still like hey you know what's the the uh, sad part Enrique Enrique Palacio in the live chat says what are you drinking right now Mike <laughs> literally just water I have no alcohol in the household unfortunately so me confusing a trust hard penalty shout with a game that happened seven days ago or so <laughs> this is my um, this is me sober, fully totally. sober so this is not yeah wow. you should you should actually see me high and drunk the foolishness that i could yeah. come up with so we uh, the goof choose to make this run properly mine, if you will. <laughs> Debbie, i'm not going to screw this up anymore Odegaard pass trussard goal go oh thing of beauty Odegaard just pulling the strings in the midfield and just to get that pass off and just placed it perfectly while as he's falling down and Trussard to uh, put it between it, the goal should have counted as two because it went through <laughs> Pepe's legs and into the far like corner. It. it was such and such a relief because it was coming. You could te- you can feel the crowd starting to get tense towards the end mm-hmm. of the half, you know, like we th- we all at least I did. We, I think we all thought that we were going to blitz them and. Yeah. 15 minutes in the game, it'd uh, be, we'd have two goals and we'd be on easy street. But towards the end of the first half, you could feel the tension, the crowd just 
getting a little bit nervous and then the relief the the ecstasy of everybody that ball going into the back of the net and just the the emirates blew up uh i had a few friends there and they said it was just insane yep the the energy the, mm. and the, the 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 volume of the the cheer that came out of everybody it was just a relief perfect time to score right before halftime and uh you know, it was just a really well worked goal from from Odegaard the the way he moved that ball. That was a quintessential Odegaard goal too, because yeah. or Odegaard setup because he sprinted to press, won the second ball, was able to take clever touches around, like so so kind of beat for speed and for angle, got to that spot on the in the left half space, and then was able to kind of he he. he draws so much of your attention because he's constantly like he doesn't stay like how you know, ben white when he's waiting to pass the ball he stands there upright and just waits to pass it at an angle well odegaard is like just moves around constantly like it's like when people used to play like fifa back in the day before the controls got good and it's just like fucking touching like back and forth and back and forth and like in circles and everything he does that all the time and so you have no idea what's happening and it was a, a loud trough started to just do an out to in run and just Again, there's there's one specific like still angle that just shows how you, he took out like four players. They four were in guys. a good they yeah. were in a good setup and a good defensive position, and it was just perfect. It was a, just a, a moment. A, 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 the door was open just a crack, and we're able to get uh, get exactly what we want in there. And then Trossard too, like great touch with the outside of his right foot, and immediately didn't give them any time to have the defense collapse. And I think that's maybe something that. I was very irritated with Saka because he just kept took a beat too long and kept getting shots blocked or he kept over touching and overplaying it. And it was one of those that Trossard, I mean, he he is a good finish, a good instinctive finisher in the box. And his he he kind of did that thing, I think, where his mind just went blank. And instead of overthinking it, overcooking it, he just I mean, it's maybe not even the perfect like maybe in a perfect world you if he's setting it up, maybe he takes it with his left foot and then tries to to pull, do a pullback or something. He took it with the outside of his right foot in stride and just quickly with very little back lift, just perfect a couple feet inside the post. No, no way any, but no way Pepe couldn't get to it. Who actually did a good job reading it and peeling off of where he was and kind of dove over. But he that's also the reason that he was offsides is Pepe kept him offsides because he could see what was happening. And so he still had to kind of go to get the angle to get in front to block the shot. And he actually took a step back when he was going over that direction and made sure that Trossard was on side. So it was kind of one of those perfectly worked goals. And it was just a, a moment of just exquisite technique and, and understanding from both of those players. And like, if we're worrying about too, because Martinelli, I think was sorely missed this match. And I think in Brentford too, but yeah. um, hit Trossard playing on the left wing for two matches and, and having being in kind of simpatico with, with Odegaard there probably helped. So, I mean, it helps having good players, but also sometimes when, when you get reps, and I'm sure we'll talk about um, uh, Kivior too, when, when you have game time and you have time with the current setup and the current players, you can, you see the, it amplifies the quality of the players. And I think that's pretty much what happened in that one. Somebody posted a, or tweeted a, a picture of a Pepe. I think it was like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Versus when we played them 20 years yes. ago or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, Henri's like scoring. It's almost the exact, exact same shot, and Pepe's in frame, and then the Trossard one. It, yeah, it's like it's from 2006. Side, then, oh, yeah. That? It's such a. I, I wish. I'll try to find it, and we'll repost it uh, for later for dear listener watching on YouTube. But he's a really he's older shot. than me, and he's because still he starting guys, Champions League. It's insane. Yeah, it's That's true. what I was going to say because it looks because exactly we're talking about Pepe too. slightly. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and. Um, I'm going to make my public apology to Pepe, who I said in, in a prediction podcast with Danny, the GFP, and Burke at Wonderland. <laughs> I was saying, oh, I can't wait for Martinelli and Saka run at Pepe. 41 year old. He's better than he was five years Whoa. ago. My goodness, dude. He, at 41, he's oldest, you know, officially oldest player to play in the Champions League. But just at what level, dude? Honestly, like it's it's one of those things, right? I, I It was kind of Aro that said it, maybe, if not Maldini, it was like, you know, nine nine times out of ten is like you just want to be in the right spot. Yeah, and and he's, out, he's always he just in the right spot. he just knows how to play the game, man. And at forty one to do what he did, and and we will talk about okay. very shortly. We'll get into the the Porto performance where we could agree that there was a lot of dark arts, but we could also oh. agree that tactically, 
holy shit, yeah. man. They they did a, a lot of really good things. And quite frankly, I I admire it because I'm a big believer that to defend in that manner and in a way you, you have to be like switched on 90 plus minutes in the circumstance for this game with that ref, 88 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, but, um, but you get what I'm saying. Like that type of performance is pretty insane. But on the Pepe thing, man, I got to tell you, he blew me out of the fucking water. Yeah, it's oh, it's family the, show, bro. Come on. The the fa- the fact that he and Sergio Ramos are still starting in La Liga and like or like there's a there's like what six six seven hundred professional matches between those two guys and like holy Christ! Like I know that Sevilla aren't anywhere near as good, but I mean La Liga is a much better league from top to bottom, obviously, than the Portuguese league. But like, I mean, it, he's just one of those. I think he's just one of those rare people that just. Is incredibly fit. He's been really lucky with injury, and he's just he he's 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 been able to maintain his physique and athleticism a lot later than most players. And again, he's not a freak athlete, but he's plenty fast and strong for a center back. He's not a he's not Murdasacker. Like he's not somebody who's all angles and positioning and smarts. Like he is, he can still run, and he is still able to cover channels and everything. And again, my suspicion is that he is not able. He's able to do that because he's basically playing like grocery baggers for like half of his domestic games. Yeah. There's the picture right there, but like he looks the same. He looks like he's the same age and that's like 20 years apart. That's insane. It's, it's crazy. It's yeah. And wild. Five years from now, I'm going to look like it's 20 years apart. Oh my God. Yeah. Seriously, Mikey, too. I look at pictures of me from I'm 37 from the time I was like 32. It's like, what the hell happened to you, man? Yeah. <laughs> Drinking. Look like I look like, yeah, no shit. Right. Like I discovered bourbon, but like, it looks like I've slept in a ditch for like half that time. <laughs> Honest to God. And he is one of the one of the masters of the dark arts. I don't know. Yeah, uh, for sure. Like uh, when him and Ben White met each other, <laughs> uh, he called Ben White his Padawan because uh, he has a lot to learn from him. And, and oh, even Kai Havers, you know, Kai is showing. Kai, his... Kai is is remarkably good at that stuff. Like, yeah, he, he is. He is right at that that edge every single match he plays, and like, do, do we know? Do we know that about him? I had no idea here? about I him not. about that. No, no, no. we didn't but see that. I love at Chelsea it at all. I love it. We we Rosie's haven't had one... a, a player like that in years, and now we got two of the Premier League's best at just being. He's, I, little... I mean, he's hated like Xhaka was by mm-hmm. rivals, but he's not nearly as subtle. Uh, yeah. or, sorry, Shaka wasn't nearly as subtle as Kai is. I think Kai has got like a, and no one's as subtle as Ben White, right? Like Ben White's yeah. the most subtle dark arts yeah. guy there is, but Kai is Kai is, I think, every bit as physical as Shaka, and he, I think he does it in a more subtle way. Kai, Kai gets away oh, with because in this match you think again, Kai like, does it subtly because I, I, I think he does I it more like, subtle than Shaka. He gets sure. away. He just gets away with everything. I, like, I, you know I, think... I, I like he's the kindest prick. Like who? <laughs> I'll, I'll ever come across. That's what he Kai? Is. like. He just, yeah. yeah, Kai. It's just like no. I mean, I think you know, like I'm just talking about the duality of Kai Havertz in the yeah. in the sense that like he he puts that big old smile. He tells you he loves donkeys, and you're like, mm. go ahead. No, go ahead, I think it's the manager. It, it's okay. No, I think it's just a fucking kill you. <laughs> the, Referees just see Goofy running around. I'm like, what's his? Oh, uh, he's he. This guy can't walk straight for three feet. Like before falling over on his untied shoelaces. Of course, that's not a real foul. Like that. That's what it is with him. You know, it's just his. He, yeah. I mean, in this match, goofy. within like ten minutes, he he delivered a pretty vicious elbow going up for a header right on right on somebody's chin. And it was like his third or fourth foul of the match, in addition to a foul that ruled out a goal. And then he pushed Kansai Sao. And he wasn't, <laughs> I love that. At, at no point was I afraid that he was going to get sent off. Like I, I was, I was very frustrated. Which I, I thought Eric Dyer had like an invinci- invisibility cloak, where he kept doing this insane stuff, but he was so stupid <laughs> and so reckless that people just felt sorry for him and just let him go. And Havertz is like the other way on the other end of the spectrum. He does all this stuff, and he just it's like, well, that's not quite enough. And Man, he seems like he's sorry. And like, he's like, how many managers has he gotten into it with this year? Like, he gets in, into it with coaches on the other team, like, pretty consistently. I mean, and, Newcastle comes to mind. Yeah, he, he got into it with Eddie Howe like three weeks yeah. ago. Well, and even the, the one at St. James Park, right? When he had that tackle on Bruno. <laughs> yeah, he cleared out Keemer. 
Flash too. And then like, and then like the whole team went after him, and he's just like, "What? What?" He had like this totally innocent, dumb uh, uh, look on his face. <laughs> uh, I, I, I swear, I hope he does that. Like, I hope he looks at the ref and goes, uh, "In German, though." But he, <laughs> how does that sound in German? We gotta find Goofy <laughs> talking in German, and we'll figure I, that out for oh the next. Oh my show. goodness, I want to hear that so bad now. <laughs> God, who who has a good who pays for AI here? Somebody, somebody. There's only there's. <laughs> There's Study. almost 70 people in the chat. Somebody do it. Oh, okay. get after I'll, it. I'll put myself uh, on mute. I'm going to try to find. But I mean, he after he after he did that to Conte Sao, he he went over and sweet talked the ref. Basically, yeah. like they had his a arm around his shoulder. He, yeah, he put his arm around his shoulder. like I'm his best friend. And like the ref was like, all right, you're good. Whatever. No, no, nothing to see here. I mean, it reminds me of the interaction that um, Kevin De Bruyne and Arteta had was it last year where they mm -hmm. got into it, which is, which was yeah. odd to see because Arteta obviously was the, the assistant coach there for a long time and he would know De Bruyne really well. Um, but De Bruyne wasn't subtle about it at all. Like De Bruyne put his hand out and pushed him and looked angry. Bad Kai enough. just keeps, he keeps a poker face. Like mm -hmm. he has, he, he's, he shows no expression until I... someone suggests he did something wrong. <laughs> and then he's got like this, like me, like me, what, like, but but it's not like a guilty me. It's like a, are you fucking serious right now? Like, yeah, it, it doesn't. What exactly? Like he it wasn't he, that bad. He carries the most innocent sort of like, I, I didn't do anything here. I'm gonna protest my innocence, but in this like kind of German, really controlled, like an unemotional way that, for whatever reason, gets bought. So I mean, as long as it works, keep doing it. Yeah, I don't. And to your point, uh, Chris, I, I'm not even entirely sure if he made eye contact with Sergio Consensao. Like he just kind of like sh like he he saw him going after the ball. He felt he was in the proximity, and I'm like, oh, just move this jerk over here. And exactly, it's kind of happened like that. So interesting. I get, I was gonna ask Sebi a question, but he's he's knee deep in finding German Goofy right now. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm gonna let him do that. You got. He's um, gonna be careful googling German Goofy right now. Like that that could really get you in some weird shit. <laughs> he's I think. about to get. He's gonna either. He's look, guys, looking if, for his German Goofy. If his camera goes off. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's send somebody to his house to find him chris um Call let's talk a little bit about the difference between, let's talk a little bit about the difference between cup games and in league games look is it is it that we're a little naive and we made this harder than what it is is it arteta maybe just not being good at cup ties which you know that you could make an argument that that is a thing because, like, if Unai Emery was in the last eight, we would still think he would make semifinals somehow because he just has that gift in cup competitions. And or, last but not least, was Porto just extremely good and well-organized and defended well? It's Man, it's a tough question only because we've got a, a quite a bit of history with going out early in European competitions. And I don't necessarily know that there is a a very obvious thread to like explain it. Um, but if I if I try to answer the the basic basis of your question, which is what's the difference between league play and in European um, competition? I think when you come up against a team like Porto, Porto is not a small club. They have won the Champions League before under Mourinho. They've had twice twice yes thank you seb um they they're they are a in in many ways one of the biggest clubs we could face in european competition from the standpoint of like european success two mm -hmm. champions leagues is is nothing to shake your head at and they've had some shit housers as managers and as players at that club um historically Mourinho being probably the best of them but their current coach obviously being not far behind so I think in Europe, differently from England, and I think this might take perhaps someone from England who grew up in England to describe like how English football at, at a very nuanced level is different from the rest of Europe. But I think you very rarely come across an English team who knows how to play right on the edge for a whole game. And that's what a, a team like Porto has to do against a team like Arsenal. If they try and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us, or even if they just set up in a low block the whole game, like mm -hmm. what we see against like an Everton or 
you know, one of the one of the clubs that knows they don't have the firepower to beat us. So they're just hoping to hang on by their fingernails for a zero zero one one draw. Um, what Porter does is they play that edge and they that's funny. They, they play that edge and they know how to play that edge and, and get away with it. Just just so. So like you've got Pepe, right, as like mm-hmm. the the perfect like um, kind of the the perfect figurine for that, for that club, the perfect talisman for that club. He is like the epitome of Porto right now, where it, where we're going to do all of the things that are right on the edge to, to break up play, to, to break up the flow of a team that really relies on flow to, um to waste time, to make sure that like they can't get into a rhythm. Cause once Arsenal gets in a rhythm, you, you kind of know it's over. So we're going to do everything to disrupt that. I think that's the mm-hmm. first thing when I'm mm-hmm. thinking about Porto specifically but I think there was also some really smart tactical things that I think this coach and I, we should give them some credit. Like this wasn't just a shit housed like approach to the game. I think tactically they actually played a really smart game. It, let's take like free kicks for example, and they did this in the in the game yesterday really well. Um, there is a a very popular thing we do, which is we 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 send our biggest guys. So usually like Gabrielle, Kai Havertz, Saliba, we stand like two yards offside when we're lined up for the free kick. And then our guys run up to the line um, right before the ball's kick so that we're onside so that we confuse that back line and we try to get them to drop early. Mm-hmm. And then we run backwards again towards goal to try and see if we can get a couple guys free for a header. What these guys did is they said, fuck that. We're not going to let them do that. When, mm. when they run up against us, we're going to we're gonna push our line higher so that when the ball is kicked, they're still offside. And they, I think they did that two or three times. And mm. they know that we're good at free kicks. They know we're good at dead balls. They know we're really yeah. good in the air with our, with, you know, with Declan Rice's delivery or, or Odegaard's delivery. And then our, our big, tall guys who are really good aerially. And they just never let us get, get a... A clean header on that we, we had offside called us on a number of times so mm-hmm. that's one of many things they did tactically that i think really um nullified some of the advantage that i think we we had and i think the other thing too in open play and i tweeted this out in response to something that that um clive uh palmer said which was he was saying how you know we need to get Declan rice on the ball more and i think that's right but i also mm-hmm. think too that they were smart in that they did the old trick that teams used to do against us last year in the league mm-hmm. where they used to sit on party mm-hmm. and they also, then they would sit on, on Odegaard and they would try to disrupt that connection between the back five and the front five. And if you could do that, you limited us to kind of horseshoe play up and down the sidelines mm-hmm. and then hoofing it into a, <clears throat> as a cross to nobody. Cause we had nobody that was tall that could get on crosses um, here. I think they did something similar where they knew Jorginho was, was sort of the key in our deepest part of our midfield. And they, and they knew that we wanted to get it to Odegaard because once Odegaard gets it, then, you know, he can start dictating play in attack. And I think they sat two guys in particular, one on Jorginho and one on Odegaard to the, to the extent mm. that it worked really well, where Odegaard had much fewer touches in that game. Mm-hmm. I think Jorginho more or less had less of an influence than he's typically used to having in a game of that magnitude. So I think, I'm sure there was a lot of other stuff that was too subtle mm-hmm. for me to pick up on because I'm just I'm I'm not a coach or a tactician. I just pick up things I see and I pick up. But those are two things that I think were really well orchestrated and well conducted that I think um, limited some of our ability to score from situations mm-hmm. that we're used to scoring in well, the league. Well, they also didn't let us choke them out. So like what we see in the league plays that will slowly just clench up more and more until basically um Saliba and Gabriel are basically playing 25 yards away from goal and if you if you let Arsenal do that to you you're fucked every like Liverpool was fucked when they had that happen you can't let Arsenal like do the bow it's it's basically what we used to kind of view City as doing really well I think I think pre-Holland City specifically like the the boa constrictor like they're slowly tightening on you until you kind of get your, your eyes get heavy and you kind of go to sleep you don't really realize it happens because it's slowly been happening over a course of time, which is possession and press. And Chris, I know you specifically during the match yesterday, like our press is not doing anything. It's because they had two different outballs. They were able to, they were able to escape vertically over the top and they were totally fine with kicking and running. Right. Um, and going over the top. And then they're maybe, very good at second balls, really and, good yeah, at getting second balls. Yeah. And being combative in second balls. Yeah. And they were still, they were, there was enough space 
in between when we're normally very compressed for them to pass and dribble through that space. And so they were able to exit two different ways. And I think they were rewarded by being, I mean, I mean, they counterattacked like a real team counterattack, not just like what Sheffield did, which is just like kick it to some jerk off McBurney trying to go against three guys. And they, <laughs> we just swept up and they couldn't touch the ball. Like, yeah, it wasn't they, long ball tactics. No, no. And, and when they did it, it was with cause. And it was, they were aiming at Saliba too, because that's the, as, as other podcasters are pointing out, that's the probably the worst part of Saliba's game is, is the the straight ball or the, the kind of angle of ball over the top that he has to go back on. I think Gabriel's better at that. I think Zinchenko is very good at that, weirdly enough. But that's a ball that has gotten to us in the past. And that's the ball they were not afraid to play. And they got and, and they did a really effective job of getting the ball the fuck away from their goal and then counter pressing and like clogging up space. But when it was time to press, like to run, they would actually run with purpose. And so it wouldn't be one of those things. But I also think that's part of the reason why, too, in the second half, I think that they really faded because the 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 fatigue on their bodies doing that against Arsenal for a long period of time and against the crowd and everything. There's a reason why I think. And, and we'll talk about this as we advance to extra time and penalties. I, I was, I, I'm always concerned about penalties, but I really, for the first time in that in that two legged tie, I was not concerned about us losing an extra time. And towards the end, I just, I think they were, even when they brought in, when when they had to bring in extra subs, those subs were not of the sufficient quality on the ball and the quality of player that it was a big downgrade because they're, I mean, it's a Portuguese team, right? It's Porto. Their second string guys are not going to be the same level as our. I mean, we were bringing on Gabriel, Jesus, and Zinchenko, and like those are much, much better footballers than the guys they were bringing on. Um, and so they pointed something out. Sorry, cr- cross. Yeah. Cr- no, no, come cross, on. I Mikey. wanted to name this guy specifically, and, and Yumi brought it up. But the, the guy that I thought was like literally mm-hmm. first game, I was like, I wouldn't mind this guy at the Arsenal. Second yeah, game, I was like, I wouldn't mind this guy at the Arsenal. And that was Varela, yeah. who got you he either generally fatigued and cramped and, and injured mm-hmm. or he was just taking the piss the last two three minutes of the first half but he ended up getting subbed yeah. and when i saw him get subbed out i was kind of like i thought that our opportunity for goal increased substantially to completely honest with you because that guy was all over the flipping place and yeah, he's one, so one well of their very for... best players in both ties for sure yeah, so when when we saw the subs, I, I do generally believe, as you said, that maybe the quality of the team, it did take a little bit of a drop. I, I think that they, it, we were comfortable going forward and not and, and being sure to not lose the match and go into extra time and penalties. And I think they had to. And, and maybe that's like a that's a kind of a, a an arrogant distinction, but I think it was one of those things that by the last. I mean, 10 minutes or even there, there was a counterattack that happened, I think, like the 80th minute or something, or it was pretty late and they were coming back and kind of running backwards. And even when they had three guys running on our three guys, it ended up being offsides. But like Gabriel and, and Saliba kind of jumped up, blocked it. And then then the guy was offsides in the rebound. Kivi or still like got in between them and, and smacked the rebound away because Raya right. made the initial I mean- save. And then Kivi or still got around him and like. It was one of those that's like at that time I was like, I'm, I'm not unless they have another worldly in them. Like, I'm not that worried about them scoring because our, our defenders are still fine. Like they're fine. Like, and I, and I think that when keep York one and I want to take this time to shout out to keep York is like I, I sent in our back channel. I was like he had an overlapping attacking run and like a little bit before that. And he was in like the 80th minute. He did this 40 yard overlap and he wasn't played the ball. I think um um, Trossard recycled the ball instead of playing the overlap. I mean, he was there. Like he could have, he could have, and should have played the overlap to Kivior. And then right after that, Kivior made like a fifty or sixty yard recovery sprint and beat their winger back and got possession of the ball again. And it was just like, holy Christ, he is fit and fight. Like he is in shape right now because all of that recovery run stuff that I was very concerned about with him initially, I, I think it was just a fitness issue. Because remember, we we saw his athletic testing when he first came in, where he's like, oh, he's one of the fastest sprinters that we've seen, and like has all these like all this vertical jump and all these athletic stuff is off the charts. And I was like, what the fuck happened to that guy? Cause he seems kind of plotting. And then this match, he was just completely covered that touchline and all the recovery runs and offensive runs and physicality and all that stuff that I'm sure made him jump off the page as a, as an athlete was all kind of in display here. And that's just also what happened. Like we have been the other side of this team before in cup competitions, right? Like when you don't have the talent, eventually yeah. when a better and when we are bigger, stronger and faster than we, we've been since basically the invincibles as a club, right. From top to bottom, like better athletes, just from a purely speed, like pace, power, 
stamina standpoint. I think they just didn't quite have that extra to to stay right on it and competitive. And they took that into extra time and into penalties. And we were still okay. We were still good. And I mean, that's a testament to squad building and a testament to like the, the type of players and, and, and athletes that we've recruited specifically. And it's, it's fine margins, baby. And that's the, I mean, the margins were really pulling in our favor just because I think largely just because of our players, which is great to see. Yeah. All right. Let's speaking about our actual players. Um, I, we, we roll into 120 minutes worth of football. Um, a very tricky game. As Kelly broke everything down, very tricky opponent. We make it to penalties. Now, I, I'm a believer in the history of football. I'm, I'm a believer in you believe having in history uh, in, in yeah. her, football heritage, if you will. Oh, football heritage. I believe in having been there before. And I'll, I'll give you an example, um, yeah. a simple example. Atletico Madrid made, made it to the Champions League for the first time in forever, and they were going up against Real Madrid. No way. I, I, I didn't care if they had Carrasco at the time. Who, whoever other good player they had, I forgot what what year it was, but they had a super team. They were peaked. They were winning the league, and I, I was like, no, they just Real Madrid has just been here. They're, this isn't a big show for them. This isn't a big deal for them. They're gonna beat Atletico Madrid, and sure enough, as day is light, night is dark, they beat Atletico Madrid in that champion. So, going into penalty, Sebi, me personally, I was about 70% sure that they were going to get knocked out, to be completely honest with you. I just thought Porto players, this was their intent since minute zero, is to make it to penalties. Well, if they couldn't keep a clean sheet. Um, there, you know, and explains why they played the way they played when they were 1-0 down, because they just were like, we're not here to score and put pressure. We're here to counterattack. We're here to, to absorb your, your offense. And our the second best option that we could have against you guys is penalties. And they went to penalty subs. And I personally going into penalties and thinking to myself, fuck, we're out. I can't believe we're out. I'm legitimately upset that we're out. I was breaking point. it. Yeah, and me my, too. I thought we were done. My wife, who is seeing me on the couch, just pissing myself. I, 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 I'll, <laughs> I'll say this. Right when the penalty shootout started and right when I left the house, I looked at my wife and I said, I actually feel bad for Lee, my daughter. She goes, mm -hmm. why? And I go, she's going to be in the truck with me during the penalty shootout. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, the minute my daughter gets into my truck, that's, she closes, Udegaard is stepping up. And I'm like, wow. I just look, I look at her, I go, hey, it's going to be a bumpy ride, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Literally and figuratively, yep. There you go. So talk to me, Seb. Were you as I'm gonna say pessimistic, quite frankly, going into the penalties, or were you feeling a little bit more optimistic about well, it? Well, I was at work and just when penalties were starting, some uh, uh big Ange, let's just call her Big Ange, she came to me and she wanted to buy some Gucci shoes. So <laughs> I was like fuck i can't watch the penalty live <laughs> but we're probably gonna lose this so i'm not even gonna look at my phone <clears throat> to keep track because uh, i don't want to lose this sale so um i have whatever long story short i'm with her this this lady for like 30 minutes and I'm not looking at my phone. I wanted to look at my phone and I was like I can't I'm gonna jinx it or if I look at my phone and then whatever she buys her shoes and then i open my phone and i look and it's a text from kelly and it says <laughs> oh god fuck <laughs> <laughs> and then the rest the is, says <laughs> a legend is born reina i was like wait what <laughs> what, what what happened I, I was gonna say yeah uh audio you. Oh, was it audio? That would have been great. No, I said Claudio because he no. said Reina. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, Rhea. Yeah. No, Rhea. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my god, we <laughs> we went through because I I was just <laughs> thinking about last season <laughs> like, and and uh, going out uh, in PKs to another Portuguese side, and I was like, I can't, I cannot. So it it could have been like. Um, 
Raya, we lost, but Raya went and drop kicked uh, Sergio Conceição immediately after the match, <laughs> like WrestleMania. <laughs> yeah, right. And I would have, I would have tweeted the same thing to you. Yeah, so. no, but dude, I was so nervous going. I could, I couldn't watch. Could not watch. I, I was, watch um, I had the uh, so I was, I was working too, working from home. I had it on over, uh, over next to me and. I was hoping that we were going to win in 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 full time because I had to actually start making dinner because mm-hmm. we had a busy evening. So I was I had my phone. I was watching the PKs on my phone while I was making dinner, mm-hmm. and I found myself so absorbed by it that like I was just not I was not cutting vegetables. I wasn't like checking the thing that was in the oven. I wasn't like doing the things I was supposed mm-hmm. to. I'm sitting here on my little screen watching this, and I'm just like. I'm like shivering and the oven's on. It's hot in the kitchen. Um, I, I thought for sure we were going to lose it because I had I had PTSD from last year against sporting. Right. We lost mm-hmm. in in PKs against sporting another Portuguese club. Um, we all know our recent history in Europe under Mikel. Like this is just another I was just saying this is just another uh, black mark on the resume, like a, another hurdle we couldn't overcome against a team we probably should be. Um, but it's I want I want to get into a quick conversation about this. I think it's really good. And, and Kelly, you you were the one that identified this feature of of Arteta's arsenal. Um, um, FC Abrao says the characters we have are fearless. This is a specific mm. feature of the squad Mick and Edu put together. And Kelly, you've um, noted that most of the players we have at Arsenal are guys that have had to fight to get where they are. Nothing's been handed to them. Few of mm. them have had a uh, a smooth road to get to a place like Arsenal. Um, I, I'd love for you to just share that because I think that's such mm. an insightful observation yeah. about how this squad has been put together and I think was key to us showing up in that big moment. Yeah, so, so first, just a quick anecdote about how I was watching. So I have three daughters that are eight and under. And so I also, because my, my youngest daughter is two and we don't want her to snack, so we usually eat early bird special time like five o'clock, right? And so I made the food and I put it on the table, but I was not eating. I was looking at my phone like Chris was because I Love needed it. to make the food and do all that because I'm not, you, you got you, you to gotta do what you got to do, right? And so I was just at one, I had somehow had gotten, I, I have my, my, I, my island in my kitchen. We have our table, which everybody was sitting at eating. And then we have our couch and an end table. And somehow I ended up for the last two rounds of penalties looking down with the phone sitting on my end table, just looking down. <laughs> And like staring directly I down, like so a much. psychopath. Yeah, like an insane person would, right? <laughs> so like, so in my and my daughters are just like slowly realizing like how weird I'm being because they're used to having me having football on all the time in the background. It's like background noise in their life, right? But again, my five year old's hungry, or my 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 two year old is hungry. I'm not turning off her bullshit kids show. Like I I, I can't deal with that distraction, so I'm watching on my phone. And love it when. when like the last penalty goes in beforehand and I see that rock, like, it's like, if we save this, we're going to win. I'm sitting there and I'm just like rocking back and forth with like sweaty palms. And then Raya saves it. I just yelp, jump up in the air and just collapse on the ground like this. And then it's just silence. And my wife just looks at me. It's like, oh, God, I know what, ha- like, I don't care if you won or lost. Like, just you're making Why a scene. I married. I married yeah. Yeah. He's like, I married that. <laughs> yeah, I married that. I've had this three of that guy's married. kids. Like, holy shit. Um, and like, my that daughters are like next to me at night. <laughs> <laughs> seriously, like, it, like out of genuine concern, my five year old, who's like my simpatico buddy in the household, she's like, Dad, are you okay? Is every, did something happen? I'm like, no, we won. It's like, why do you look so sad? And I was just like this, like, <laughs> you're so overwhelmed by the emotions of it. And you're so relieved and happy that you're just like, it took me about 10 minutes to reintegrate with my family. I was like walking around, like taking a break and then like walking to the next thing and taking a break and just being like, oh my God, like we won, like, holy shit, this is amazing. But anyway, that, that was my experience. And I was for the last time I did that, I scared the shit out of my kid when when Saka scored late against uh, United. You know, when Eddie scored late against United, I jumped up and screamed and scared the shit out of my then one year old daughter, and she was oh, like that crying one. basically. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, so 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 the uh, kind of what what I have observed about Arteta and squad construction, Edu and squad construction, is that I mean, 
there are a lot of teams that have players that are kind of where I was God's gift and where I was the golden children. Like and I think of Manchester city a lot and it's maybe not super fair to them, but like you got to remember that Arteta's path to, to elite football was, was he was originally at La Masia, but couldn't cut it. Right. So he couldn't play for Barca. Um, he was kind of, he had to go all the way to, I mean, to Scotland, to Rangers. Rangers yeah. Right. And he had to PSG come in before he, they were PSG. Yeah, and, 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 and again, low rent kind of like, Yep. like mid table France PSG, like he was around it and he had to go to Arsenal and he, or he went to Everton too. And he didn't get to go to Arsenal until fucking trolley dash basically. And we needed him and, and was able to force it through. So he has been through the shit. Right. And he kind of, I'm certain that his playing career while mm -hmm. good. Right. And, and, and well serviceable. And like, he certainly accomplished a lot as a player and as a captain and an Arsenal man, but his body even gave out when he got to the show. And so he, I'm certain that he didn't accomplish as a player what he he thought he would as a 16 year old at La Masia when he's buddies with Pep and like some of the great some of the great Spanish players and the great Barcelona players ever. He was at La Masia at the same time and was was with the youth teams at the same time. So look around the squad and, and see where these guys have been. And like we talk about like character being a priority and how many people he fucked off because of like low character and everything. Like Ben White is like the only player or one of the only players to score in like four divisions of, of football. Like he was loaned all over the place. Like he's been, he was playing in league two at like fucking Peterborough, like not so long ago. And uh -huh. and you keep going around like Geb Gabriel Magaliash was on loan and in like Croatia after he first got brought to France, like D David Raya didn't didn't start a div first division game. Like he came from Spain and was in, I want to say like the Reading Academy, and he's been all over the place. And he didn't start playing in the top division until he was like twenty six. Um, you you just keep going through, and even our like golden children too, like because that's the other thing you come at. It's like well, Saka is basically the only guy that has had this straight arrow. Like Trossard was playing at Gank, I think, into his mid twenties. Like th these guys have scratched and clawed and just succeeded and, and were, were got transfers on merit and changed positions and done all this stuff to be able to play like um, again, Zinchenko. I mean, it, it grew up in Ukraine, like, yep. like t tons of personal and professional strife and like Gabriel Jesus, there's the famous picture of him painting the streets during when the, the, like the curbs, when the world cup was there, like he obviously values people who have been through bad times and come out the other side. And he values character and he value that that is an important part of what makes an Arteta player an Arteta player. And you and you look around the squad, even look at how many players play different roles and do different things. And why do they do that? You cannot be a prima donna and do that. You do it because that's what the team needs, and that's and you're willing to do anything to help the team. Again, like your key VR who went from playing in an in eight thousand seater stadium as a as a center back in a in a back three, and now you're he's starting decisive champions league matches as left back in a back four in front of 60 plus thousand people at the Emirates. And like, that is character. Like that is, that is an, a, 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 um, a vindication of recruiting and character. And again, not just of, of technical skill, but of like balls. And that's why when we go into that penalty shootout, like our players were, all of our takers were mint, all of them pure slammed home. No doubt. Keeper wasn't close. All of them. Because they're ready for that moment again, like and again, even like Odegaard, who was like supposed to be God's gift, right? Real Madrid at fifteen, he he was in the lone army, he was everywhere, and he was basically thrown aside for fucking Danny Ceballos, right? Yep. Like Kai Havertz, who was the I mean the the next big thing in German football, even won a Champions League at Chelsea, but they largely lost a lot of respect and like he all his momentum was stopped because of how shit Chelsea were and how poorly they were using him in managerial turnover. So he was a reclamation project, like. Every single guy that Arteta's like most trusted lieutenants all came through this grit and shit. And like, it, it really feels like there's this kinship and spirit and character that that unifies this group. And again, not just with each other, but with the manager and fucking with the fans too, right? So yep. like, we were this, the, the club that was like the, the elites, the aristocrats, right? And we spent a lot of time in the wilderness, guys. A lot mm -hmm. of time. And for a lot of us that are in America, we haven't been able to watch Arsenal at their pomp for like physically. We haven't been able to see them. We had like one match to watch. Yeah, every we week. saw them in the newspaper. If that, we, yeah, we saw them on the newspaper, and like there wasn't even fucking YouTube back then. Like we had yeah. nothing to go off of besides banter years and just sucking shit from all these other clubs. And if it, it makes coming out the other side of this, it's again, it's like Andy Dufresne 
coming out the other side, ca- crawling through a mile six of miles shit, of shit, six, six yep. miles of shit, and being washed clean by the rain on the other side. And we're not there yet, but th- there's some very, very unique and unifying spirit that connects our manager to our players to our technical director to our academy director to all of us all around the world. And that's really something that's special. And that's why, like, when people kind of guffaw or scoff at what's happening here, it's like you wouldn't fucking understand. Because how would a Chelsea fan understand? Like, how do United fan understand? You don't. How does City fan? You don't understand. You yeah. don't get it. That's right. A true City fan might understand because they've been through fucking. But there's only like a hundred of them in the world. Though. Seven of them. <laughs> but I... even Arteta, like even like like Saliba was supposed to be the the next golden child, right? Mm-hmm. Arteta kind of made him go on a journey. Yeah, you know, he was the only one that didn't have a hardship. So that the literally, <laughs> yeah, the hardship. he made him. He one. Made him. <laughs> to, to, to have the same mentality, to be on the you same page. You get to page. go play with Ganduzi but, now. <laughs> uh, you had at Marseille, but, but look at him now. Remember, his there's glass in that too for you, fucker. There you go. Deal with that. <laughs> I thought about you guys when I saw at celebration of uh, Saliba. Mm-hmm. At, at the end of the PKs, when he's yelling at the fans, showing the badge, pounding his chest, I thought of the three of you, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, I think it's episode twelve. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I keep receipts too, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys were like, "No, nah, he's gone. He's gone." I think we just yep. signed Ben White. He's like, "Yeah, he's sure. gone." And I was like. The- can't be it cannot be this guy is gonna be the next big thing he has to come back arteta cannot let him go and it's just been a, like 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 you said kelly everybody on the team has gone through this thing and it seems like arteta put him on that journey to mm. to be on that same wavelength as these guys so yeah. it, it's just amazing it's an amazing squad that he's built and mm. It, 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 fe- it feels like we're this is going to be a, a group no matter what if they if they achieve what we hope that they achieve this year yeah. but i think this cohort of like you know how we out like when Embry was here it's like kind of tongue in cheek chanting we got our arsenal back like yeah we we kind of do and I, and i think we have it we have it in a way that is I, I think even more rewarding and again like all history outside of our fan base and outside of our club history will will only remember this group should they win the premier league or the champions league in this kind of two to three year run where they represent the core talent. Right. But I, I speculate that we as a fan base will remember them for far longer, no matter what they accomplish. Yeah. That's, that's so. my sense. And and I think that's yeah. the point of all, like winning things is the point of club football. Right. But the point of being a fan of a, of a global club is, is exactly what's happening right now. And, yeah, and th- I, we, we need to embrace what we're in the middle of right now. During one of the, uh, as as said would say, during episode 10 uh, or whatever, <laughs> when we were losing our shit, we're up to 159 now. So, guys, we've been doing this for a while now. We're like, the, we're like the like the 74th um, longest standing Arsenal pod out there, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> we, if anything, it's consistency, Chris. Yes, it is. Uh, no, so I... I my, I did do these two bold predictions several years ago. Arteta is going to stay with the club for at least 10 years. Mm. And I mentioned prior to things getting this good, I said, I truly believe out of the group of players that we're putting together, we're going to at least get a few cult heroes. And mm. and similar to what, and I think that's what exactly what Kelly was, was kind of alluding to. So we, we haven't put that, you know, that we haven't dot the eye yet. We, we haven't finished the project. The story's not done, if you will. WWE. We haven't Cody Rhodes it yet. We haven't finished the story. We haven't Cody Rhodes it go. yet for, for you WWE fans out there. Um, the story is not done, but man, if it happens, we're going to be the third English team to actually earn a Champions League in its modern format. And I think it's going to be pretty epic. So I like how you qualified that perfectly, said Mike. Yeah, that's that's my that's my ongoing theory. So, um, well, okay, so we were all nervous. We all emotionally scarred our children, except Seb. He emotionally scarred a customer, or the customer did that to him during the penalty shootout. Um, I will say, 
to uh, I forgot which one of you two made the point. It was either Chris or Kelly, but it, those shots were so well done, dude. And it, it got brought up in the live yeah. chat as well, saying that um, the the interview for Saka after the game. Here it is, Dev M Saka interview with Henri. After he said he knew where he was going to place the pen days before the game, and dude, I gotta tell you when. The Udegaard shot went in. I'm like, holy shit, that was like well placed. Like I'm thinking to myself, put Oblak there, put insert top quality. No one's people. getting it. Yeah. I'm like, mm-hmm. nobody's getting that. And then I see Saka and I'm like, I mean, and I Fly. look at my again, I'm trapped yeah. in my car. I say I'm trapped. I'm driving my daughter home from school. And I literally just look at my, my daughter and I go, You know how I go, you know how good you have to be to strike the ball that hard and place it that close to the to the um post. Yeah. And she and of course. I'm talking to her about science. I'm talking about her things that she can't even comprehend right now because she's looking at me like, okay, weirdo, whatever. She just kicked the ball. But I was just so impressed with all the penalty takers. Well, and um, Diogo Costa, whatever his name is, the the goalkeeper, he could not get a read on which side we were going to be kicking it to. He, I don't think he ever guessed right. I don't think he ever could read where we were going. And mm-hmm. I think this is a point that was made by Clive on the – um arsenal vision podcast today and he reminded me that this off season this past off season in the summer we took penalty kicks at the end of these friendlies Mm -hmm. and we were all like what in the hell is this like this isn't football this is like some Mm -hmm. sort of americanized bastardized version of football but what arteta was doing was he was i think readying the club for important moments like what we had yesterday where it was going to come down to how good you were at penalties. <clears throat> I mean, remember Vieira missed one and then he, and then he came back and made one, you know, I was a, there. a following. Yeah, you were there. So you remember. And um, I think there's been a real finer point put on some of these kinds of uh, parts of the game um, starting in preseason this year that I think, as you might expect from a guy like Arteta, he obsesses about because he knows that like in the champions league the difference between winning and losing can come down to something as small as did you make your penalty or not? <clears throat> and it, it you know he even joked like in the press conference he said mm-hmm. we've been working on them and some guys have not been doing so well in mm-hmm. training so um i, I think it's just <clears throat> I, I think we've got a now a group of of guys who know how to handle the pressure mm-hmm. who rise to the occasion and and with a coach like Arteta who drills them within an inch of their life, I think <clears throat> you, you combine mentality with physicality and technicality and cool coolness under pressure. And you've got mm-hmm. a lot of winners in your team. And I think we've got exactly that right now. Um, and it starts with Odegaard. He set the mm-hmm. tempo. He was the one that stood up and said, I'll be counted. Went up there first under all that pressure and scored the first one. And I think mm-hmm. that could be, that's some of the hardest thing to do in football. Mm-hmm. is to play for 120 minutes, run your socks off like mm-hmm. he did, um, go up there and kick the first penalty kick and strike mm-hmm. it as well as he did and set the tone. And we've all seen what it meant to him at the extra time. We've all seen the fan video where he just collapses. You can see it's like both it's physical and emotional and all the play, all of his teammates come and pick him up. Like, yep. Just again, the love that player, man. Yeah. It's just everything that you want an Arsenal captain to be and represent the club with class and, desire and athleticism and being humble and that it's just any any everything that we could have wanted him to be and then some yeah he he embodies the club um Mm -hmm. more than any other player out there but another close shout another penalty taker not to ignore him um i'm I'm willing to go 99 plus 6 Mm -hmm. million in add-ons for for declan rice now not quite (laughs) 100 mil (laughs) um because it's a good hill to die on and uh, about saliba mike tell us about saliba (laughs) oh yeah you know what i I forgot to bring that up um sebi because you were not on the pod yes last time i praised him elite Mm -hmm. hope he stays and now he's shit but now that you're on the pod he's just the only way you can make it up to me is you Mm -hmm. rocking a saliba kit that's right challenge He's like just a, a French Maguire with a with a beret. God, <laughs> with a beret, eating a baguette, <laughs> like a full baguette too from yeah. the end. Yeah, like I, give, I give Sebi ten hours before that that image of me with with a beret and a baguette. <laughs> you <laughs> gotta do it, Sebi. On Twitter yeah. somewhere, it's, I just know that it's been written. 
<laughs> it's been written. All right, let's let's uh, look. This this podcast has been heavily influenced by our priors and us actually being right about some things for a change. Hey, uh, dear listeners, we gave you the last international break a full podcast of everything we got wrong. But go back and listen to that, by the way. That was some fun stuff. It yeah. was actually some fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of podcasts go out of their way to pinpoint and just take the piss out of themselves. But here we are. Um, <clears throat> one of the other priors that that we've had on this podcast for a very long time. And the the guy that led that conversation <clears throat> was our very own Kelly. Um, he has been sweet on David Raya yeah. since day one. And like, mm -hmm. uh, I, look. I'm I'm one of those, and and I understand that the majority of people are in, you know, Raya or Ramsdale camps. I was in. I really don't like. I don't feel strongly. I didn't think it was a quote unquote wrong way to replace Ramsdale. Um, I was like, oh, competition, and but I didn't think Raya would take his spot so quickly. And and Kelly mm. almost from week one was like Raya would be the starting goalkeeper after the first international break. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Ramsdale yeah. was never to be seen again, pretty much outside of a few um, actual games that Raya could literally not play in a few comp cup competitions. So Kelly, David Raya, he finally had what I used to refer to and for, for Ramsdale, his Leicester city moment. Mm hmm. Cheeky plug in, check out my blog in the morning, some details, your topics yeah. from tonight. So Love Mike Mike McDonald, McDonald, Mike McDonald from Goonerstown. Uh, he does an excellent plug um blog, excuse me, positives, hopes, and needs. Um, read it, guys. It's 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 a long read. He often inserts a little audio clip as well, and most of the time mm. it pops up on sound sound uh, wave, I think. SoundCloud. SoundCloud. There you go. SoundCloud. SoundCloud is the application that he uses. He normally mm -hmm. plugs in the link at the end of his article. So not only do you get to read the article, which is by all means, guys, I'm I'm telling you, I'm, if there's something that I read, and that's why it's so fresh in my memory, it's, it's actually Mike's blogs because I do find them really insightful. He's always yeah. willing. I will say this: he always puts himself out there. Yeah, as he does. soon as you're done with Mike. the article, he expands on it in great detail. So. It's a pretty insightful thing. It's pretty fun. He gets pretty creative with it. So I would strongly recommend getting in there. Go yeah, ahead, Mike McDonald doesn't hang out with a Transformer, a Decepticon Soundwave. He, he, uh, <laughs> there you go. There you go. Sound <laughs> Gay fucking nerd. He's not an all evil you. villain. All you, all yeah. you Mike people. Nerds. <laughs> no, nerds. No, no. I remember that. You know what? I remember SoundCloud because I literally downloaded the application because he's the only guy that I know that uploads consistently on SoundCloud. Uh -huh. So I know the link's going to take me there. But yeah, yeah my and, and he said he's actually going to detail some of the, the topics that we're talking about tonight. So what are the chances that we're uh, overlapping? So pretty good stuff. <laughs> But McDonald, um, can you do me a favor? The next episode, can you do the, your monologue in and the the voice of a sound wave? Uh, to <laughs> thank you. I'm, you're gonna have oh, to do or curse that. Mike. No, my no, Mike might might know we, that actually. Yeah, we got we got 130 plus people watching you, fucking nerd. Stop talking oh, about sound. Right. We're, we're talking about we we've managed to talk about wrestling <laughs> and transformers. Hey. <laughs> anyway, so David Ryan. Uh, David um, Ryan. Awesome. Apparently, um, he's yeah, good this, this is Kelly's victory over. tour. Um, I always, <laughs> it, I, I'm not gonna be super smug, which is really out of character for me. Um, so I'm just gonna let, yeah, that's me, that's me behind the blinds on social media, <laughs> looking at all the Raya love now, just soaking it in. Um, no, it's the reason why I've always liked Raya is that it was pretty clear how he's gonna fit Arteta's system. I, I was critical with him too, I did my own search and I was pissed at him for some of the bobbling and some of the stuff that happened during the bad times too, but largely a uh, great style fit, great culture fit. And, and I think we're the, the greater fan base is seeing how he helps control matches with how well he plays and how accurately and calmly he plays with the ball at his feet and claiming crosses. And who's a better shot stopper? Ramsdale's a better shot stopper, but who's better at everything else? Um, I shall rephrase it. I don't think Ramsdale's a better shot stopper. He can, he can make saves that Raya cannot make, but in that one that that one particular category is flashy and it's um, noteworthy when when Ramsdale makes some spectacular saves. But um, the the boner stuff that Ramsdale does a lot, and and I think it's been people super cut this together, and it's easy for us to get too ahead of ourselves with social media comparison. But like how Ramsdale has expressed pretty openly that he struggles to stay engaged with matches and and it's concentration issue, and he likes being busier. 
and and Raya is more. I mean, well, he's older. I think he's more mature. Aside from just being physically, like, literally older, I think he's a more mature human as well. And he, he's Raya has talked at length in a lot of interviews about the ch how about he challenges himself to stay engaged always. And I think being a better player with your feet and being a larger part of build up and and being a more integral part of that and and being more in, off his line a lot. I think that helps him stay engaged, but I think it's just a personality thing too. It's just an attention span thing. It's a concentration thing. And the the style of football that Mikel Arteta requires puts an outsized emphasis on the things that Raya does best and, and a lower emphasis because of how little possession we give away and how few shots we give. It's it's just less on what what he does. In the same way that like Manchester United are probably just fine with having inferior shots to ever, but a better footballer at goalkeeper now. Um, ha ha ha! But like he's gotten through their their goalkeeper is, is actually quite good, um, largely aside from making some mistakes and crumbling under the pressure a little bit. I'm I, there's a reason why they have the keeper they have now, and um, their ex keeper is still unemployed um, nine months later as somebody who cannot kick a football to say almost comically so for an elite goalkeeper. Um, anyway, th this was a great kind of I think Raya moment where he's I think fought the fans a little bit, and I think it's made it difficult on him psychologically and personally. Um, but since after coming out of the Dubai break, um, it seems like he has all the confidence in the world. He has, he clearly has the confidence of his manager and his teammates. And in he, this, this is him on the big stage. I think is fully the, the, the last fans begrudging fans that were resisting this change, I think are, are understanding why. And he, and I mean, not, nothing screams getting the fans on sides, like being do dominant in the penalty shoot. And he like, he stopped two of them and he really, really almost stopped a third one too. Like mm -hmm. he got us, he just couldn't quite get there. And I think it, we need to be reminded that he is quite a good goalkeeper as well. In addition to the passing, in addition to being Arteta's boy or whatever, like he is quite a good goalkeeper in a lot of different ways. And it, it's kind of funny too, how he went, the first thing he did, like when they came over is they were, it was, Naki Kanye or what they're going through the they're going through the preferences and everything and I think they didn't they talk to Raya too and they're like he he remembered he memorized all of them anyway from earlier in the week he knew what other penalty takers would be and where they preferred to go and he was just doing a review and everything and it was just I think it was one of those moments where after he stopped the initial one it's like you kind of felt like okay this is him taking this and this is his time now and he should be floating on air because there's nothing I, I can't imagine as a goalkeeper anything more invigorating and empowering than man of the match penalty stops faultless in a champions league knockout match at home when that, that giant monkey was on our back for a decade and a half. So kudos to him. I, I I've been saying, I told you so a lot of mine, which I, which I did tell you so, which is great, but it's going to be a little bit smug here, but I think past exactly. my, past my bullshit, I, I I'm just, He's he's the right keeper for what we're doing right now in the same way that Ederson is maybe not the greatest goalkeeper in the world, but is the right keeper for Pep Guardiola. And if, yeah, if there was ever a perfect advertisement for how different <laughs> um, Raya and Ramsdale is to each other, it's mm -hmm. it's the, it's this game against Porto and mm -hmm. the game against Brentford, right? Mm -hmm. Because those are back to back games. Mm -hmm. um, Ramsdale pulled off the seemingly heroic in terms of some of the saves he made and, and let's be saves. clear let's be clear i think he makes um saves that are hard make, make he makes them look even more spectacular because of the way that he extends his body and flails around and we've we've been talking about that for a while like he he just loves to make things look spectacular um but he also makes those mistakes because of the focus that you talked about kelly mm -hmm. and i think what I think what Arteta needed to see in a keeper that was going to be kind of the part of the finished product, the finished squad that he really wanted to assemble for a team that mm -hmm. could compete for everything was a player that could communicate calm, that mm -hmm. could um, be the first attacker at the base of the, at the base of the defense, right? Which is what the goalkeeper is a guy who could command his box when balls would be flying into in, into it a guy who could have a good rapport with his defense and a guy who could stay engaged for the full 90 which clearly raya raya can and does and while we all love ramsdale the person and the character and we had wonderful moments with him last year like spurs away is a great example of that 
mm-hmm. um, and, and many others. And we'll always remember him for that. Um, Raya is the perfect fit for who we are now. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a real, it's a real message to the rest of the squad too, which I think the rest of the squad is generally who it's going to be now for, for a bit, at least in mm-hmm. terms of our starting 11 mm-hmm. minus perhaps the, the number nine. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, you know, as good as Ramsdale was as trusted and loved as he was, Arteta is a madman. And if mm-hmm. he thinks there's an upgrade opportunity on anybody, he's going to take it. Yeah. He's not afraid to do that, even when it's unpopular. And we all we all heard the the messages coming out of the the team and the club that like some players were wondering why why Ramsdale was being shuttled to number two and he was really loved by the team and um, you know he's an England international and we have a lot of English players in the team so there was a camaraderie there that you know they wanted to have stay intact and you know Raya seems like a bit of a more of a quieter guy and he was in on loan and. All the things came out and it suggested that that was a big risk Arteta, Arteta made. But hmm. at the end of the day, if Arteta, and I think we we, we need to learn to, to trust his intuition and his talent evaluation, that if there's a guy he really wants, I mean, he's proven us enough, time, enough times wrong as fans that we should probably take his word for it. I mean, we've been wrong on, hmm. uh, there's a lot of people who are looking pretty silly about their Kai Havertz perspectives. A lot of guys who have looked really silly about Raya. Um, a lot of people have looked really silly about Ben White. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had a really good laugh at um, rival fans who were making fun of us because we got Odegaard over um, um, what's his face, uh, oh, yeah. smug fuck at uh, Spurs, Madison. Yeah, Madison. Madison. Like um. people, people have been taking the Mickey out of our own fans have taken the Mick out of some of the things that Mikel has done. And, and some of the choices he made and rival fans have too. And everybody's look silly in the end, outside of like mm-hmm. the William and the Cedric that happened in the first summer that he was here. We were trying to shortcut our, our way back to the champions league. If you look at the roster of players, he's bought mm-hmm. very few have flopped. In fact, I would say the only ones that have flopped have been guys that were punts anyways. Yeah. So um, I think it's best that as fans, we get behind what he wants to do until he approves it otherwise. Well, also you look at, and, and we won't spend a ton of time on this because we have an international player coming up, but like you look at when when we have fully have our technical director and manager on side ready to go, look at January in the summer. Look, look at the last calendar year of signings and what they did for us this week, <laughs> right? Like, look, look at all of them. And it could it could have been all of them if Timber had been healthy. We don't know what part, but I mean, yeah. starting the Community Shield mm-hmm. is a versus you know one of the the heaviest, if not the the biggest opponent that you can during the entire yeah. season. There's reason to believe that Timber was going to feature very heavily, not only because of the minutes that he got during preseason, but the he, Community Shield itself. So he, he was it likely could have the, been four for four. He was likely going to be the starting left back for this season. That was mm-hmm. that was likely the plan for him. And so, like, when you look at that, you extrapolate that out, and it's just, I mean, you, you talk about Adu grilling with a cigar going, like, holy shit. Like, he's just got all the, he's not getting a lot of negative Instagram messages anymore, is he? Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> shit's not happening anymore because it's. Now they're yelling at him to barbecue. <laughs> Will you just smoke some more fucking cigars? He's getting back to some more meat, they do. Smoke some meat and some cigars, please. Yes. I love that he goes and responds on Instagram to every all the players' posts. By the way, yes. it's like this is this is a very like Arteta needs to not be on Instagram, so I'm fine with that. But it's so funny that like Eddie was just like <laughs> cruising the social medias on his phone. He's like, yeah, preheating the grill. He has downtime. Yeah, That's right. but, hey, the, the nice shirt that, unbuttoned or- just so just. I said, Avril is trying to get me, get us to go one more hour because he's trying to bait me with it. Doing Mikel Arteta or Arsene Wenger's men. <laughs> just a total, just, <laughs> just no. I'm not, I'm not partaking in this. Calling him Why the professor you? doesn't it? No, does it again? No, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not going down this rabbit hole. He also signed Murdasacker too. I think, oh, son of a bitch. All right. <laughs> hey, that gave us a great song. Okay. It gave us a great song. Yes, absolutely. One, One more, more hour, hour for Wenger. I like that. You, <laughs> now he's just a, officially a trolling. Bad man. Now he's trolling man me for sure. Is. But no, gentlemen, let's talk before we end the podcast. Uh, 
that we did make the last eight quarterfinals of the Champs League. Mm-hmm. We have the possibility. Now, this is not, we're not going to get into great detail. This is more a little bit of a prediction, if you will, because we will be breaking down matchups that's going on for the next Tuesday podcast because there's no football for a few weeks. So, might as well chat a little bit of more detailed Champions League stuff. But just so that we could look like asses, I would like to see if you guys, let's, for, for funsies, let's predict who Arsenal will get. We've got Atletico Madrid, Barcelona, Bayern Munich, Dortmund, City, PSG, and Real Madrid. Go ahead, Chris. Tell me, what does your crystal ball say, sir? I mean, it's written in the stars. I know you're not asking me this, but City will get Dortmund because they're the easiest of the bunch. We just know it's going to happen. Right. Just, it's the complete opposite of what I just asked you. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. <laughs> um, <laughs> I couldn't help myself, Mike. Uh, I did. That's the easiest one to predict. It's it, it's so obvious. Um, I think we will get Bayern. Um, We've been drawn against them so many times in the past. I mean, it's either them or Barca, if I had to guess. But it's football heritage. Um, I think there's way too many storylines that come out of playing Bayern to ignore. Um, and I think UEFA loves their storylines. Football loves their storylines. And to the extent that any of this is rigged, um, it's rigged. Jim Hugger probably is. It, it's it's rigged. It's rigged to create you know, fascinating storylines and to get the people that they want into the semifinals and finals that they want. So um, I will say Bayern. I think we will get Bayern. Um, Who do I want, though? That's a different question. Can I answer that one, Mike, too? Yeah, go for it. Um, I do want Dortmund, but I I put up a poll on X. If you're on X, uh, feel free to check it out at West Suburban AFC. I'm really fascinated by the psychology of 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 a fan base whose club has not been in this situation for 14 years and and who do we want and so i excellently allows you four options and so i kind of group them by revenge which is barca or bayern basically because those are like the two clubs that we seem to always get in the champions league we can never get get past um so there's definitely a revenge factor there i i I combine madrid and city because i think they're the elite teams they're the two teams that i think are probably ranked ahead of us in terms of odds to win it Uh, madrid because they always do and city because they're a super team Mm -hmm. um i combined athleti and psg i don't know that there's that much in common but i do think that both of them pose a bit of trickiness like athleti just because they're like porto times a thousand in terms of their dark arts Mm-hmm. and PSG because they have Mbappe. And as we know, the, the Champions League, if it's nothing else, it's a, it's a game of moments. It's a match of moments. And um, when you have the best player on the planet playing for you, um, that could be a tricky proposition. And then Dortmund in a kind of a league of their own. I, th- I think they're probably the easiest one, although I don't think any of these are easy. Um, and when you think about going to, to Dortmund away, um, they're one of the most um, intimidating places to go. Um, so I don't think that that's going to be easy, but if it's, if I had to rank like all of those seven opponents, which one's the easiest, I would say Dortmund. So for me, I want, I would like Dortmund. I, I want the easiest path to the final because ultimately the goal here is not, is not to avenge past, uh, past losses. The the goal is to win the champions league. And so I I want Dortmund, um, for sure, but I don't think we're going to get them. Kelly, you're up next, sir. Yeah, I mean, I concur on, like, the easiest road. I think, I mean, I'm a Dortmund supporter, as we all know. They fucking stink. They have a manager that should be gone at the end of this year. He's not a good coach. He's a cheerleader. Um, and Dortmund had to survive off of goals by Marco Royce and Jaden Sancho. They they don't have any big ideas. Their defense is really – they have a very good goalkeeper. They have a very poor defense. Um, Emery Chan starts and plays every minute of every match as club captain. If that gives you any indication of where they're at right now, like they are not good. They're really, really mediocre. So I prefer to play them because even going into West Falls Stadium, like they're they're a little bit of that hoodoo is broken because they've been really bad for the last nine months or so. And like the next, like it's not even a revenge thing, but like my next pick would be Byron. Byron fucking suck. They're not good. They have a de- like, like they that. have a. They have a, they are not going to win the Bundesliga this year. They're not going to win um, the their, their domestic cup. They they have a manager who's a dead man walking. Tuchel's leaving at the end of this year, so they don't know what's going to happen. 
the the only part about that that I dislike is Harry Kane and and the narratives and storylines of Harry Kane because he's going to score at least one or two goals against us no matter what. But they are dreadful defensively and they play a lot of like mediocre players. Um, I think they started um, Rafael Guerrero at left back who is fucking terrible and it was like not good enough for Dortmund to resign last year, which is some quite something. Like they're how not awesome. Very good. How awesome would it be though for us to like be the team that prevents Harry Kane from winning it's the only trophy that's on oh, offer. God. Like, like, but I'm not, but, but I'm not running the risk because Harry Kane has still scored like 35 goals this year. He will still yeah. score lots of goals. It's, and I don't, I, a Dortmund are a, an objectively worse team than Bayern. And so I prefer Dortmund, but Bayern's a close yep. second. Um, also Barcelona. I, I, I don't give a shit about the La Masia stuff. Like Barcelona are not good. And their superstars are fading and, I mean, Lamille, their their superstar sixteen year old is actually twenty, which is fucking hilarious too. That's <laughs> starting to break now too, which is like yeah. really another really one. funny. And again, another one that they absolutely knew about and are lying about. But fuck it, man, why not? Um, so those are the three that I would like to play, and it's it's really not narrative. I think those are the three worst teams that are still left. So yeah, the teams that I don't want to play, I don't want to play City three times in a matter of a couple of weeks. That sounds fucking terrible. Yeah, because um, City are the best club team in the world, so I don't want to play them. Um, and really like past that, like, I don't want to play I kind of, Atletico Madrid. I don't want to play Atletico Madrid because they're very similar to Porto, but also they are, they're hotter than Porto. If that makes sense. Like you can get under their skin deeper than Porto. I think Porto are worse technically intact, but they're more disciplined. And so like, it, basically what happens when Havertz does what he does, like, Basically, her Mario her, Mario Hermoso comes in and puts a leg breaker in and gets sent off. Like like they, Rodrigo they have, to Paul totally get sent off. Yeah, like like yeah. they they have that switch in, <laughs> and I think Atletico too basically are, are powered by Griezmann. And the only reason that Inter lost to them is that Inter thought they were going to cruise that match, and then they got bit, which is fucking hilarious because fuck Inter, obviously. But like, um, <laughs> obviously, but like, as yeah, as you do. <laughs> as, as they do themselves and and knock out competitions clearly um but but yeah i mean i think it's one of those things but here's the really good thing about this we could beat any team that we play any team that we play over two legs we could beat and that that hasn't been true basically ever in my entire arsenal career ever ever as a fan like supporting I, there's never been a time well first of all we don't go to the we don't go to the quarterfinals very often but like when we do we are literally we can we can beat over two legs any of these teams and we can I, again i would prefer to not play city and i prefer to not play the the biggest teams but we we are firmly in the top probably the top half of strongest teams and i i, I don't I, I don't i'm not this is the kiss of death too i'm not i guess psg are a one-man team and like they have a lot of average players that are not challenged particularly often domestically so like i'd be fine with psg as well but you got to score more. The biggest thing that we are going to start, we have to score goals and knock out competitions. It can't just be suffer ball like we did this past. Like, whatever you do, we have to become more potent and be more threatening and then trust our defenders to defend. And if Mbappe gets, Mbappe gets a couple goals or Lewandowski gets a couple goals or Kings gets a couple goals, you got to score more than that. And that's it. I mm. think, I think um, if we faced PSG, we're going to. PSG and Mbappe is going to realize why he didn't come to the English Premier League. He's going to be running ragged with Saliba and Gabriel. <laughs> well, Very well, Saliba I like put it. Uh, Mbappe in his pocket when he was playing for Marseille. So uh, See, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, picturing like a like a heroic key viewer tackle on Mbappe that will follow him forever for the rest of his life. That'd be great. Yeah. All right, yeah, for real. The, the, uh, the romantic uh, handshake between Mikel and uh, Mbappe. At the end of the Arsenal winning four two on aggregates, just uh, starting the rumor mill for the whole summer. <laughs> Seb, give me who you think we're going to face, who you want to face, and who the fuck you do not want to face. Who I who I think we'll face. Um, I think I, I just think we're gonna get fucked over, and we're gonna get City. Ugh, Boo. I know. I just have a feeling we're just gonna get it. We're gonna get play them three times. I, I can. I don't want it. It nobody wants it. Um, who I want to face? I want to face Barcelona. I like Fuck it. Fuck them. <laughs> oh, 
hard, like <laughs> sideways. Like I, 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 I hate them. In that, that is the, the the European team. I hate the most. They're a bunch of cheating bastards. Uh, and I just hope one day they they get their comeuppance and get relegated into. I don't know. Anyway, and then uh, who was the last one? Who who you think? Uh, who do you want to play the least? Yeah, I, I don't want to play City. I I, I think we're gonna get City. Yeah, I think we're gonna get City, and I don't want to get City, and I want to f up Barcelona. Sweet, sweet for revenge on those bastards. I they stole a Champions League, yeah, uh, from us, and. Uh, I'll, that I will never let that go. I hate them more than anybody. But imagine, Seb, if we were to play them, we beat them five times in a season. That would be outrageous. Outrageous if we did that. I know it'd be amazing. It'd be amazing. This but... would be the 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 penultimate season. This would be the most amazing season Arsenal has ever had. If we did that and won the Champions League and the Premier League, it would it would be the best season. I, I don't think you could argue any differently. It would definitely remove any of the you had an easy pathway to the final. <laughs> yeah. we, no, they'd I somehow mean, say like City City's having an off year. Blah, blah, blah. Like they, yeah. would, they would do yeah, it. It would sure as hell remove That's that. Right. Um I think we're going to get Real Madrid. Mm. I would like to play a team like Bayern or PSG who I perceive as achievable but they're still a big name and i think that eliminating a big name on paper in world football might give us a little bit of extra oomph, if you will um and as far as avoiding for me it's a mentality thing man just I like to I, I am assuming that emotionally and physically must be draining to play manchester city because we yeah. saw the two games that we've had thus far this season, they're not typical games. We 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 wait more. We're way more patient. There's not so many passes. There's less possession, but it paid off the two times. It paid off in the Community Shield and it paid off at the Emirates. And I just think it's a different type of football. I know it's not not so much free flowing, but considerably more organized, almost Simeone um, way of playing. So. I just think those those type of games take so much out of you that I would much rather have a one-off versus sitting in a final than to play them two more times or an extra time, uh, regardless uh, if we make the final, of course, one one more extra time in this season. So that is it for me. That will be the podcast for tonight. We're going to tell dear listeners where they could find us, where they could see you um, bombing rival fans at, at the <laughs> – yeah. and Kelly's almost out of booze, so he's definitely not podcasting anymore after that. <laughs> Chris, you want to tell me where they can find you? Everybody knows where to find me. If Everybody they knows where to find me. They haven't, if they haven't seen me retweeted or 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 liked or I don't know, shouted down by somebody, um, you must not be very active on Twitter. I'm all over the place. But if you somehow have missed me, West Suburban AFC on Twitter, um, I like to get into it with rivals. I have a problem. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to seek help for it. I'm sorry. I'm just not. Just lean into it, baby. I'm not, I don't apologize, and I will continue to do it. And as I said at the top of the pod, I'm going to be an insufferable bastard if we win anything important this year, just so you guys know. <laughs> just... You're like that McGregor gif that says, I would like to take the time to apologize to absolutely no one. <laughs> <laughs> Human version. To absolutely gift. nobody. Yeah, yeah that, exactly. that's, that's you for sure. Uh, and last but not least, Kelly. You well, to, not last but not least. Actually, that's Sebi. <laughs> Sebi, Sebi's last and uh, least, I'll, obviously. I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely least. Definitely least. Go um, for it. Kelly. You have to answer for that French official in that fucking match, man. <laughs> um, yeah, out, at South Metro AFC, again, I'm fairly chippy. Um, I have a lot of big opinions, and I will admit why I'm wrong, but I will tell you when I'm right too. So it's been it's been a fun. Uh, I think that's what was like after about two minutes after that match, after I got done, uh, just losing my fucking mind at home, and I kind of came back into the chat and went, "Ooh, this is a good day for Kelly's priors." 
it's a very good day for uh, my opinions of the past. But anyway, at South Metro AFC, again, it's been a lot of fun, guys. Anytime that we have all four of us here, it's always unique, special, fun. And like, again, to all of you guys in the chat, on Twitter, online, 160 people uh, viewing us right now, which is great for us. And so please like, subscribe, um, iTunes, Spotify, all the places wherever you get us. Um, it's it's a lot of fun. It's more fun when we have you guys here with us. So yeah, and definitely. For those, people, for those people that are have like 12 accounts that are watching us to pump up our numbers, thank you. The Braille. Super yeah, I think he's up to, he's up to three yeah. digits yeah, now. I mean, I mean, it was like 130 of those. <laughs> you already <laughs> started a new promotion too. Guys, this team chat, I heard that if you get a you get a potathon with a thousand subscribers, he's already He's already hey, drumming up some interest there. Like, hey, I'd do that if we get a you, thousand subs. Well, if Magic ever sobers up from being over in in, in London right now from this uh, uh, Champions League match, like we only we only get one hour of the potathon. Like, I mean, let's. let's oh, we get, got two hours last year. We did get two hours last year because we're in the middle of the night. Nobody wants to be on there in Europe. But like, we take um, wins here, or right? hey, don't do that to us, Kelly. We take wins around here. Listen, I'm happy to do the graveyard shift. That's. Second, 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 second shift needs uh needs love too and we are that we are the i mean if we haven't been named already we're the official london area second shift podcast of arsenal right 100 like, an official official i like that sevi talk to oh, us uh, first of all i would like to say uh <laughs> give uh a big all. happy birthday to to the one and only magic mike it was happy his birthday, birthday yeah. feinberg feinberg it's your birthday <laughs> We're going to get copyrighted because if you sing anything that sounds similar to a tune, YouTube. Oh, YouTube really? Is yeah. Birthday was if you sing it terribly. Record, yeah. Well, not only that. I mean, I changed the lyrics for, for another thing. And another, and, and another thing is, what are they going to do? Demonetize us? <laughs> hey! Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, he stole all of our money. Oh, what's 100 percent of zero? Oh, <laughs> I'm taking all of it. Oh, quick maths. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Zeps. Uh, yeah. Uh, happy birthday to Magic Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the pod with you guys again this week. And tomorrow is 498 in Bengal wow. series. I'm what really man, struggling man. with movies and shows. Uh, I need help. So if anybody thinks of anything that they want to see Wenger in, just shoot me a DM or tweet me, and I will make it happen. It's I, I'm I'm starting like it's at nine o'clock. I finally figured out something to do tonight. So uh, yeah. So, but up the Arsenal. Up the Arsenal. True words never been said. My name is Mike Curtis, your host for the night. Uh, it just occurred to me, dear listener, Napsters, as uh, Feinberg and Sophie from Highbury Squad mentioned, uh, if you're on Twitter, I would really actually appreciate it if you're watching right now. Go over to the actual YouTube channel and give us a sub. I would really appreciate the support. It's just a numbers thing because once we hit 500 as a channel, we have access to more features so that we could interact more with people that predominantly watch us on YouTube and don't have, well, it's not that you don't have access, but they choose not to be on socials. So if you are watching on Twitter, um, we appreciate the sub. Any Every time we get closer to that 500 mark, uh, it gives us the opportunity to do polls and other random things in the live Only chat. like 1,800 more to go to get to 500. That's it. <laughs> We're so close. We're so close. <laughs> <laughs> this has been not another Arsenal podcast, aka the Lucas Podolski of Arsenal podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Boys and girls, thank you so much. Live chat, you have been absolutely amazing. Ooh. Until next time, good grass. Peace. Right here this time, Martin Odegaard. Sinchenko. From Ketchia, it's in it for. Martinelli. Perfect. There is a gorgeous arrogance about Arsenal now. It really is. They are enjoying every second of this.